Attention Institute personnel. Our Patreon account is back in action, so if you want to get your hands on some cool rewards or just want to support us, you'll find a link in the description. And as an added bonus, we've produced some custom wallpaper for this episode, which are available exclusively to all members of our Patreon. Once again, you'll find the link in the description. Have you ever had one of those evenings where you've gone out for a walk, admiring whatever it is people admire when they go out on walks, when you slowly begin to realize that something's a little different, something you can't quite put your finger on? It's only when you look up that, yep, your world is being attacked by the Galactic Empire. lived on a planet that had aligned itself with the Confederacy of Independent Systems during the Clone Wars, or one with a local government not friendly towards Palpatine's New Order, chances are you might find that scenario somewhat familiar. Following the establishment of the First Galactic Empire, it was not unusual for the new regime to deploy forces to put down Separatist holdouts, rebel cells, or local crime lords, with varying levels of success. So one has to wonder, how would our world, 21st century Earth, fare if one day the Galactic Empire decided to invade and occupy it? Now, obviously, if it really wanted to, the Galactic Empire could blow up the Earth with the Death Star, or just bombard it into the Stone Age with the Imperial Starfleet. So we'll assume in this hypothetical scenario that the Empire, for whatever reason, is instead looking to occupy the planet and establish a new regime, akin to how it treated Lothal or Mimban rather than Alderaan. Alright, so where to begin? It seems to me that the best way to answer this question would be to take a look at the tactics and equipment of each major element within the Imperial military, from stormtroopers to star destroyers, and try to determine how modern military forces on Earth would fare against them. And before we get too far, I want to make one point especially clear. Various technical specifications have been declassified or leaked by rebel spies that purport to measure the power of weaponry and armor used by the Galactic Empire. I'll be ignoring those, because I suspect they have been embellished or falsified as part of a misinformation campaign. Instead, whenever weapons and armor are discussed, I'll be using footage of those weapons in action, how they perform against common objects like trees, snow, rocks, as the basis of my comparison. Okay, so starting with infantry. The Stormtrooper Corps represent an elite formation within the Imperial military, and would certainly be at the vanguard of any invasion. All sorts of variation of Stormtrooper exist, but generally they are equipped with white plastoid composite armor and E-11 blaster rifles. Special weapons such as sniper rifles or heavy blaster cannons are distributed within squads, but more commonly deployed within independent fire teams. Now, the major disadvantage Stormtroopers face in combat is immediately obvious, their bright white armor. Several explanations for this color choice exist, from it representing the purity of the Empire to it being the color most able to reflect blaster fire. Whatever the reason, the end result is that, unless they are being deployed to the Arctic or in the middle of a blizzard, stormtroopers are immediately recognizable. Compare that with infantry units on Earth, which since the first few years of the 20th century have been almost wholly equipped with uniforms designed to blend into an environment. Over the decades, these have become far more sophisticated, incorporating various camouflage patterns and even technology meant to reduce a soldier's infrared silhouette. There have been plenty of conflicts on Earth in which soldiers have needed to wear their watch faces on the inside of their wrists or stop lighting cigarettes because even the slightest reflection or light source could give away their position. Put a guy in a white suit of armor that's going to make a distinctive clunking noise whenever they move in any of these battlefields, and he isn't going to last very long. The weaponry used by stormtroopers is a bit harder to assess. Individual blaster bolts seem to impact with roughly the same force as a bullet, while heavier blaster rifles used by designated heavy weapon troopers or aboard vehicles seem comparable to small grenades. Generally, the intense plasma energy fired by blasters certainly seems to have the potential to inflict greater damage compared to most small arms used on Earth. Additionally, with power cells capable of holding hundreds of shots, individual stormtroopers can carry much more ammo at a fraction of the weight. The major trade-off seems to be in the rate of fire. While the E-11 blaster rifle is capable of automatic fire, in practice it seems to be limited to no more than a single shot every few seconds. Whether this is a limitation of the design or due to how stormtroopers are trained to use the weapon remains unknown. 
There is also the issue of the blaster bolts themselves. Highly visible bolts of plasma make every shot and effect a tracer round, enabling stormtroopers to see exactly where they are hitting. This works both ways however, and once they start firing it's going to be immediately obvious where stormtroopers are positioned. This is again something that militaries on earth have dealt with and developed tactics around. During the Vietnam War, the NVA used green tracer rounds against American helicopters. These remained visible against blue skies, but were camouflaged against the jungle when seen from the air. Stormtroopers, by contrast, use red bolts, which are going to be visible basically everywhere. Lastly, Earth forces have the option of only using tracer rounds when necessary, something not available to the Empire. Between these competing factors, my guess is that with a much higher rate of fire and greater variety in small arms, infantry squads from Earth militaries would be more than capable of defeating their Imperial counterparts. And before you tell me that Stormtrooper armor can deflect artillery shells or Imperial blasters could tear apart armored tanks, I would remind you of the Empire's defeat on Endor, in which blaster fire was stopped by trees and Stormtroopers were killed by falling rocks. It's also necessary to take a quick look at the tactics used by the Stormtrooper Corps. While organized into formations roughly analogous to those found on Earth, fire teams, squads, platoons, etc., the level of coordination between these elements seems to vary wildly. In combat, Stormtrooper units tend to scatter without any regard to unit cohesion, establishing overlapping fields of fire, or maintaining a solid line of advance. Formations seem easily isolated, only sporadically calling in supporting fire from air, artillery, or any type of reserve unit. The idea that no plan survives contact with the enemy has long been a piece of military wisdom, but the Stormtrooper Corps seems to put in the extra work to make sure of it, only to deprive their officers and soldiers with the flexibility needed to overcome the practicalities of any battlefield. The Empire's infantry would have a difficult time fighting against modern Earth militaries, but their walkers and other vehicles are completely outclassed. Armored divisions are typically used to breach defensive lines, working with other divisions to exploit this breakthrough and through a combination of maneuver and firepower, achieve a decisive outcome in battle. To do this, the vehicles involved need to balance speed, firepower, and survivability. By relying on walkers, namely the all-terrain tactical transport and the all-terrain scout transport, the Galactic Empire makes major sacrifices in both speed and survivability. Compared to tracked or wheeled vehicles, Imperial walkers are plodding. During the Battle of Hoth, rebel soldiers were able to catch up to Imperial AT-ATs on foot, which moved at a rate of barely 6 miles per hour. While certainly capable of creating a hole in an enemy defensive line, Neither AT-ATs or AT-STs seem capable of the mobility necessary to properly exploit this breakthrough. Most main battle tanks on Earth, by comparison, can achieve speeds of roughly 30 miles per hour in rough terrain, and nearly double that on paved roads or more suitable ground. They are also designed to fire on the move when necessary, incorporating increasingly sophisticated stabilization technologies that ensure a tank's cannon is not affected by the vehicle's movement. This is something completely lacking in Imperial walkers, which often need to stop to ensure greater accuracy. Tanks on Earth have employed various methods of protection over their history, from ever-evolving types of armor, to electronic countermeasures, to active protection systems. But one of the most important methods of improving vehicle survivability is to reduce its profile on the battlefield. The smaller the target, the harder it is to hit. Modern tanks are designed in accordance to the theory, don't be detected. If detected, don't be acquired. If acquired, don't be hit. If hit, don't be penetrated. If penetrated, don't be killed. The basic idea here is, while there are many different ways to survive getting shot at, it all starts with not getting shot at in the first place. Strangely, the Galactic Empire seems to have followed the exact opposite approach, creating ever larger vehicles that would dwarf those used in the Clone Wars only a few decades earlier. Imperial walkers are designed to tower over the battlefield, which, while potentially allowing the vehicle to fire over cover at short ranges, makes them conspicuous from miles away. Their design philosophy might be summarized as, Hey everyone, look at me, I dare you to shoot at me. Proponents of such designs usually argue that walkers like the at, -AT can intimidate the enemy into abandoning the fight. I think this drastically overestimates the value of enemy morale in vehicle design. Sure, the first British tanks used in World War I may have caused the enemy to flee, but it was sporadic and lost effectiveness over the course of the conflict. Maybe the mere sight of AT-ATs will cause modern infantry to panic and retreat, maybe, but once the initial shock is worn off, the Empire is still left with a giant, obvious target. 
My guess is that a few Apache or KA-50 attack helicopters firing anti-tank missiles from a mile away are going to reduce the intimidation factor of an AT-AT to zero. So what about the war for the air? The Empire is infamous for its vast fleets of TIE fighters, but against modern fighter aircraft used on Earth, I don't think they have much of a chance. The TIE Striker Air Superiority Fighter is generally regarded as the finest atmospheric starfighter in service within the Galactic Empire. Interestingly enough though, its maximum airspeed of 1500 km per hour is roughly equivalent to that of an F-100 Super Saber, which had its maiden flight in the early 1950s, served as fighter bombers in the Vietnam War, and has long since been replaced by much faster aircraft. American F-22 Raptors, Russian Su-57s, European Typhoons, and most advanced air superiority aircraft used today can reach speeds of upwards of 2,500 km per hour, nearly double that of a TIE Striker. If we assume that standard TIE fighters, interceptors, defenders, etc. are even less capable in atmospheric combat, then the Galactic Empire, in terms of maximum airspeed at least, would be going into an air war at a major disadvantage. Of course, speed is only part of the picture, but when it comes to armament and engagement distance, two major deciding factors in any dogfight, TIE fighters come out even worse. Generally, TIE pilots seem to need to rely on visual data to engage their targets. They do so only at very close range and usually at distance comparable to the air warfare of World War II. On Earth, modern air engagements are typically fought over exponentially longer ranges, with anything less than 30 kilometers known as short range. Beyond visual range missiles can be effective at even longer ranges and are increasingly employed on modern aircraft. It seems to me that most Imperial Starfighters are likely to be shot out of the sky before they even realize enemy aircraft are targeting them. Maybe once Earth's fighters run out of missiles, the engagement might be more even, but when you consider the presence of surface-to-air missile platforms and even shoulder-mounted anti-aircraft weaponry, the cost to the Imperial Navy of achieving aerial supremacy would be very steep, if not outright impossible. Of course, TIE fighters won't be the only things flying around in Earth's atmosphere during an Imperial invasion. While Imperial soldiers, walkers, and starfighters are undoubtedly inferior to their counterparts on Earth, the same cannot be said for a Star Destroyer. Far larger than even the most advanced warships fielded by any terrestrial navy, Star Destroyers represent the Galactic Empire's ace in the hole, but would they be enough to solely turn the tide of a planetary invasion? I think the answer is a solid maybe. In orbit, Imperial Star Destroyers would be almost untouchable with only ICBMs capable of hitting them, and in space these missiles would be much easier to intercept. We know that the engines and shield generators on a Star Destroyer can be destroyed even while its shields are up, and that the Empire is not used to dealing with missiles with a range of thousands of kilometers, so maybe an ICBM strike would be effective. Regardless, the mere threat of orbital bombardment might be enough to force some sort of conditional surrender, and if used properly, would certainly be the deciding factor in any land engagement. However, if the goal as stated is for the Galactic Empire to occupy the Earth and not just destroy everything on it, Star Destroyers would eventually need to enter the atmosphere, and the opportunities for engaging them increase dramatically. I believe the biggest threat to Imperial Starships is not anti-ship missiles or ICBMs or massed artillery though, but rather the complete lack of cybersecurity within the Imperial military. Over the course of the Galactic Civil War, the Imperial military repeatedly displayed systemic incompetence with regard to the protection of their own computer networks and critical infrastructure. Imperial officers and troopers appear to be highly vulnerable to spoofing attacks, wherein fraudulent or malicious communications are disguised as having originated from an official source. Imperial networks are not segmented. A single second-hand astromech droid in a hangar's control center can gain access to the entire Imperial network. Perhaps most critically, even obvious breaches of Imperial security, whether within the highly sensitive manufacturing facilities critical to the Imperial Navy, or aboard the infamous DS-1 orbital battle station are not responded to in an efficient manner. In the time it takes the Empire to respond, security breaches give any invading force ample opportunity to inflict immense amounts of damage. With such lapses in Imperial network security, who was to say that through cyber warfare and other such methods, an entire fleet of Star Destroyers could be disabled remotely? I mean, in at least one other invasion of Earth, this tactic proved to be pretty effective. Of course, until a fleet of Star Destroyers appears over major cities on Earth, my arguments remain mere conjecture. And who knows, maybe Imperial Stormtrooper armor would prove invulnerable to atom bombs while a single blast rifle could blow up an aircraft carrier. But I believe there is one last major vulnerability 
in the Imperial military that would doom any attempted invasion of our world. More than anything, the Galactic Empire is built on fear, and its internal military discipline is no different. Fear can make sure that stormtroopers walk a straight line in formation, but it tends to lose its effectiveness in battle, especially if that battle doesn't immediately go their way. Modern military training on Earth instead emphasizes pride, pride in a soldier's units, branch, and nation. This ensures discipline can arise from within, even when it lacks from without. Put another way, the Galactic Empire lacks spine. While I am uncertain whether they could successfully invade the Earth, I am positive they could never hold it. Eventually, those Star Destroyers would be needed elsewhere, the local garrison will get lazy, and the occupation will collapse. And once that happens, a kind of countdown begins for the Galactic Empire, because as soon as military forces on Earth begin to grasp the concept of hyperspace and interstellar travel, it is only a matter of time until our planet begins building its own fleet of Star Destroyers, and the Empire's main advantage is lost forever. Maybe in 50, 100, or 1000 years, there'll be a fleet of Earth's warships in orbit of Coruscant, dictating to the rest of the galaxy the terms of their surrender. But that, of course, is just my opinion. And even though I and I alone command a zeppelin of unassailable truth, I'd like to know your thoughts. Could the United States Marine Corps beat Imperial Stormtroopers in the battlefield? Could SU-57 shoot down TIE Defenders? Have I cherry-picked my data only using stuff that supports my argument while ignoring everything that doesn't? Let me know in the comments, and until next time, this has been Incoming. Or was it? Because there is one other thing I'd like to mention. If you're interested in how we created the custom images used in this episode, we've posted a special behind-the-scenes look to our secondary channel, the Templin Archives. It's a pretty cool time-lapse video of one of the images from start to finish, so do check it out. And again, if you want to download those custom wallpapers, they're available exclusively to our patrons. You'll find the link below.